It's daybreak from Trust Television, reaching you from the nation's capital. You will be having Sunday Ogo, the deputy business editor of Daily Trust newspaper, to join us for this review. Good morning, and it's good to have you, Jones. Welcome to the show. Good morning, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to have you, yes. Uh, now, we'll begin with the Daily Trust newspaper. In case you don't have a copy, you should get a copy of the Daily Trust uh, newspaper. You have all the information there. We'll begin with the first story below the nameplate. We won't allow foreigners overrun Nigeria. That's according to the military. You also have uncertainty as Lagos Airport Terminal Projects stalls. Contractor abandons work. The next story there. Senate approves budget framework. Pegs oil price at $57 uh, per barrel. And then the lead story on the Daily Trust newspaper. Two years after MOU, FG's $2.3 billion Siemens power project flops. The writer says project at design stage, phase one, yet to begin. That's according to officials. 2021 target of 7,000 megawatts not feasible. And then government creates companies, shops for engineers. You have <coughs> the pictorial there is showing you, excuse me, the pictorial there uh, shows you pensioners under the auspices of local government pensioners association in Ogun State yesterday blocking the main entrance to the secretariat in Oke Mosan Abiyokuta uh, in protest there. Below that, electoral bill, fresh dust as Senate raises conference panel. You can find that on page 32 of the Daily Trust newspaper. At the very bottom, anti-open grazing law. Southern governors hit back at Erufai. Recall that uh, the governor of Kaduna State there said the open grazing law is not implementable, mm. whatever that means. Uh, you take a look at also another story there. Amcon takes over ex Quara governor's mansion over 5 billion naira debt. Yeah, a video went around on social media yesterday showing that. Uh, you also have the last story there. You can find it on page 6 saying, Buhari Ganduje mourn as Emaya of Gaia dies at 91. These are some of the major stories that uh, we are looking at this morning on Daily Trust newspaper. Let's get your thoughts on the lead story on Daily Trust today. Uh, quite an investigative report uh, there, uh, trying to get the facts. Uh, what exactly is going on with that project? Well, I think the, the headline basically says it all. Um, there was this high excitement around power, you know, when this conversation came to the fore. And um, uh, it is pathetic because this is a conversation that was held at a very high bilateral level. Uh, we had the president of Germany and that of Nigeria, you know, coming together to discuss what can be done, you know, to change Nigeria's power fortune. And at that very serious level of conversations, uh, they came up with ideas to, to, to be supported by Siemens, which is a, a giant uh, when it comes to uh, conversations around power. And, and from there, you will recall that, in fact, we lost the last chief of staff why it's moving around the world trying to get this deal sorted, you know. And after then, two years down the line, we should be talking about 7,000 megawatts by the end of mm -hmm. December. This is three months to the, mm -hmm. to the end of the year, and there's really nothing on ground. Now, is this as a result of the delay of the release of funds or some kind of disagreement? Our investigation revealed quite a number of things. Uh, there seemed to be some kind of power play between the presidency and the power ministry where this critical project should be done, sir. You would think naturally that the power ministry should be driving this initiative, but it is domiciled in the presidency. So the question you really want to ask is who has the expertise in the presidency to drive a critical project like this, right? You will recall that even when the late chief of staff had to make that trip, we, there were no reportage around representation from the power ministry. So clearly there is, there is a disconnect between whatever conversation is happening between Siemens and Nigeria, the power ministry, and the presidency, whatever that means. Mm. Okay, now despite um, Nigeria producing 8,000 megawatts of power, only 4,500 richest consumers, do you think there's, there's something wrong? Of course, it clearly speaks to 
a whole lot of wrongs, all right? Um, so it is, it is not enough for you to say you have capacity to generate 8,000. At some other times they've told us it's 10,000. At other times we even hear it is up to 11,000 and all. Installed capacity, but that they are only able to evacuate at peak 4,900. Mm. What it means is that the distribution channels, the whatever it is that is supposed to evacuate that power from where it is produced into our individual homes or places of work, just don't have the capacity to do that, the transmission channels. They are either aging or they are grossly inadequate. So uh, there needs to be a lot of investment in that channel. Right now, it is only government funds that is going into transmission because it is not designed in a way to give anybody uh, any kind of profit. So the private players are playing in Jenkos, which is generation or distribution, which has to do with some kind of money. But transmissions are those old poles you see running from one end to the other. They are mostly government properties. There isn't no kind of tariff type around how power is carried from generation points to your houses. So that continues to remain a government uh, responsibility. And you know, uh, the government is battling to put funds in various places. So that has, that has staffed that sector or that aspect of the critical funds they require for massive expansion and infrastructural renewal. Mm. All right, then <laughs> we are seeing also, you know, another conversation about the electoral bill here. Uh, it seems like there's going to be a whole lot of other discussions. Uh, electoral bill, fresh dust, as Senate raises conference panel. Uh, are we not, is this not a reversal of all the gains that have been made? Uh, not exactly. If you recall, um, the Senate passed a different version of the amendments to what the House of Representatives passed. So. Uh, conventional dictates would uh, require that they set up joint committees, that is what is called the conference committee, to harmonize those gray areas, you know, and come up with a position that is then adopted by the two houses and presented to the, gov to the president as a common front. Uh, you know, the Senate was saying, uh, INEC cannot do electronic transmission until it resorts to uh, the NCC and itself for some mm -hmm. kind of clearance. The House of Rep did not put all of those conditionalities there. And uh, you know, so the question would be, what would be the consensus? They've raised the seven-man committee from the Senate, as promised by the Senate president sometimes somewhere in a public uh, engagement on Tuesday. So uh, hopefully before the end of the week or next week, we should see the representation from the House of Rep. The only fear is that we were looking at uh, the constitution of that committee, and we saw that five of the seven are the people who stood against electronic voting. So, I mean, even though they call it a committee, it's beginning to look like a fait accompli. Mm. So do you think electronic transmission of results will work in a country like Nigeria? I mean, INEC is saying they have the capacity. Remember, INEC is independent. Subjecting the independence of INEC to another independent body, you know, kind of call that constitutional responsibility to question. And um, two, I think the whole idea is not whether the entire country must be covered 100%. But if you could do it in 70% of the places, why not? Why are we shutting down network in most of those places where we are fighting if there were no coverage in the first place? Mm. You know. So we can safely say that between 70 and 90% of the country is covered. Hmm. The telcos can tell you, the, the telecommunication companies can tell you that. And if, if that is the case, then why can't we have electronic voting in all of the areas that are covered? Because it does look like the future. Hmm. It does look like what seems logical to do. Mm -hmm. How, why would you have to cons uh, conduct an election, say, in a place, in an interior that takes about uh, eight hours to get to the city, and you have to wait eight hours to confirm that result when you can basically just... And uh, observers have also said that it is in the process of transmitting those results yeah. that the actual of the region happen, takes place. Including some members of the National Assembly. They are beneficiaries of those kind of regions. So at the polling ground, they lost. But when the results have been declared, it's something yeah. else. And then you hear all kinds of stories about how the NYSC returning officers were relayed on their way back <laughs> and mm. compelled to, to say something different. And they themselves have come to say, yes, for the safety... For my safety, I cooperated with whatever it was that happened on the road, but this is position. But, I mean, the pronouncement has been made. It will not have to take a long court process to reverse all of it. We can save ourselves all of that headache.
So should, should we say this is why um, they are opposing to the use of electronic voting? So it's a dicey one. They keep hiding around no network coverage in my village. Um, <laughs> you know, but the question is, what does you and I want? Uh, I know in the newsroom yesterday we had very broad debates about who are the electorates. Sixty percent of them are age brackets. How does this whole amendment speak to us, the millennials or Maybe those of us who were born before the millennium. You know, so what do they contain our aspirations as young people if we form a bulk of the population? Is it self serving? Uh, should we continue to hold this country to ransom because some people have refused to come to terms with what reality is? These are questions that are left to be answered. So the question will really be what do we want? How do we get it? And that is talking about you and I. Okay. Oh, quite. Um some headlines there. Um, let's move on to the next paper. We're going to be looking at the Nation newspaper. And we have right at the top, Nigeria pushing to recover 2 billion loot. Uh, we also have 2.3 billion cocaine seized at Abuja Airport. And right on the right there, we have Makinde nominates five as commissioners. Five billion debts, Amcon takes over ex-governor's mansion. And the big headline right there is zoning. PDP North leaders take formula before panel. And the writer says, we'll stick to 2017 distribution of offices. Ugwai panel meets with party chiefs in Enugu. And uh, talking about the VAT row, VAT row threatens federal government 8.36 trillion to 2022 revenue target. And we also have open grazing, Akiro Dolu Okowa Ohaneze, Slam Erify. And below that, we have subsidy scam, how firm defrauded government, government rather, of 1.48 billion, Bauer tells court. Uh, okay, let's uh, discuss uh, the big headline there. Zoning PDP North leaders take formula before panel. What are your thoughts uh, revolving about all, along all of that? Yeah, so I think it's basically everyone trying to make sure that they get a fair deal, you know, come 2023. Uh, yeah. and, and this is okay, you know, and we are a very politically active country anyway. So uh, it's about every zone making sure that whatever becomes the consensus as we build up to 2023 that they have adequate representation or that they are not came out uh, of, of, of things uh, you know so uh, formulas essentially it's about how where should we shop for the president and what happens to all other positions beneath the presidency including the party chairmanship in what ideally should represent a fair representation of everyone, yeah. every geopolitical zone, so that, you know, it kind of calm, calm nerves and give everybody a sense of, we are part of this, you know, let's, let's give it a chance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, they are saying they, they're going to stick to 2017 formula. What, what do you think prompted their decision to do that? So every time you take a position, you just want to be ensure that your interests are adequately protected. So... These formulas are not in cast on soon. At the end of the day, there will be some kind of consensus, and it's a give and take thing. Oh, okay, it will make sense if position A shifts to this side of the country, but as a compensation for losing that, we would have this domicile in your place. So, uh, you know, they keep testing the waters and looking at what is workable, what is practicable. Some things are just in the realms of ideas. Mm. But again, you, you don't approach... A negotiation table from a weak position you have to put out all your strong cards and i think that is basically all of the politics that is taking place ahead of 2023. <laughs> so you know talking about political inclusion and uh, consideration from geopolitical zones one region that you know has been contested is the southeast region talking about Igbo presidency and all of that do you see that this you know formula is in favor of the that region of the country well, the people from the society will tell you no formula had favored them in recent times, all right? Um, but again, there is an explanation to that. So, a, in a political contest like ours, nothing is given to you uh, on a platter. Mm. 
you have to be part of the system to get your fair share out of it. So how much of participation are we seeing from those people, especially as it concerns the parties in power or the major opposition parties? You know, so, uh, so the question is, nobody will go to that consensus and begin to argue on your behalf. You have to be on that table arguing your case, you know, building consensus. And, and at some point they say, okay, I think it's common sense that we head to this part of the table. You cannot sit aloof, as some people have argued, and demand that something must come to you. So uh, what I am saying in essence is that would then demand that the South is begin to build consensus around themselves. What we see, and speaking as an individual, is scattered voices you know, tilting towards different, different directions. So today, if you really want to ask yourself, who are the first two, three consensus candidates from the, from the South, it, it will be difficult to point at anyone. Mm. Yes. I mean, if you, if you are looking at the Southwest that are also agitating for one, you can begin to point at one, two, three names, you know, but that's not exactly the case when you look the other way. All right, let's take a look at on the other issues now. The Daily Sun newspaper has some of the stories there talking about the Southeast. Uh, IPOP threatens one month lockdown in Southeast. Uh, you would also see uh, the lead story there says laws against open grazing. Akeredolu hits Arufai hard. Uh, the rider calls Kaduna government, uh, governor's statement against Southern governor's uh, devious. You will also see uh, below that, below the pictorial in particular, you would see Yoruba nation agitators protest in New York, demand separate state. Uh, the rider says Nina's Ilana uh, Omo Odua, this own plant, uh, Washington rally. Uh, that's that. I think these are about the major stories uh, on the Daily Sun uh, this morning. Now, I mean, the conversation about the Southeast, I want us to stay on that. Uh, you mentioned how, you know, the involvement, the level of involvement will determine a whole lot. And uh, we, have, we are seeing diminishing involvement, uh, not just even in, in the politics, uh, but also in other aspects, like even in business, for instance. You have this sit-at-home order uh, that has lingered for quite a while now. I mean, is it in the interest of the majority of the people there? That's, that's a difficult one to, to knock, and I will tell you for several reasons. One, you cannot afford a vacuum in leadership, right? Um, what we have seen largely, now speaking as a layman, let me not, uh, let me avoid this tyranny of uh, of my thoughts, uh, being a general opinion, is that recognized institutions, including those of governance, have failed to fill voids, you know. And so we have miscreants coming up and filling those voids and dictating the narratives. And that is why a faceless body can say nobody should come out and nobody dares come out. Not even the government institutions themselves. So it's not just about business is not open. Even government offices are not open. So it means beyond the facades that we see, you know, with some government officials saying, no, we have countered this, we provide it. Okay, deep down, there is a deep-rooted fear that supersedes whatever assurances that those who should be in authority are given. You know, so until those recognized institutional frameworks, the government, civil society organizations, the leadership of uh, major religious but begin to come out and speak to what would give the kind of confidence that these people need to come out. These miscreants will continue to hold control. This is not to diminish the agitations by these people, you know. Um, I think it's a, sol it's, a, it's a genuine demand. Self-determination is nothing, I don't think is anything wrong. Perhaps how you go about it is what offends the sensibility of other people. But I also think that if the institution are up and alive to their responsibility, we should be having a conversation over a cup of coffee or on the table rather than just shutting out and nobody is talking to her. Because 
you know, what happens eventually is there is a limit to which the sit at home can go. People will run out of food stuff. People will run out of stocks. Businesses would no longer. I mean, we had a general lockdown for viable reasons, COVID-19. And on upon return, businesses could not come by because they eroded their capital. Not to talk of a forced lockdown. You know, so what becomes of the survival of these people? Because first of all, people worry about their lives and livelihood. And you, you need to preserve your livelihood to be alive. So at some point when you run out of food, you would not, it would not matter who else is giving instruction if the only way to survive is probably breaking into another person's shop to get food. So I hope we don't get to that level, but the government, both at the center and at those state level, must make some kind of concerted effort to really nip this in the board and then get <coughs> those faceless people to some kind of conversation. Yeah. So what do you think um, Erufa is pointing at? pointing out rather by his statement you know erify prides himself as uh, a rough life of feathers <laughs> yeah but beside that i think he points most times we make issues of uh, serious issues become a matter of personalities rather than the real issues and i think his contentions really is it is not just enough to talk about grazing laws without really providing alternatives you know so what is the conversation around that alternative Okay, uh, there is no grazing. You want people to go into the ranch. What provisions have you made? You know, to ease that transition. And you don't stop something that has happened over several hundreds of years by just fiat or a pronouncement or a law that you pass within one week. No. Mm -hmm. What becomes, you can't criminalize your own citizens. Well, uh, I mean, I thought that the South East, South South governors. Uh, leaders in the South or the politicians and all of that. They've said that, well, anyone wanting to do business in terms of ranching is free to do so as long as you come, you get a land and you do that. That is assuming all of the process are the same. But you and I know that even to build your house, you know what it takes to do documentation? Mm -hmm. That's a legitimacy. You are not asking for anything wrong. You've got your cash on you and it takes eternity to get a CFO. You know, not to talk about dealing with people who are headers and probably had not seen the four walls of a primary school. It will need being handheld and gradually led into what we all believe is even a greater, I mean, a better way of doing things than what they are used to. You don't wake up and legislate habits. Some will say that doing that will mean that you are treating others with some kind of special preference. Uh, I mean, the argument is you have people, Nigerians, all over the country doing, doing business. Uh, some from the southeast uh, in the north doing business. And nobody gives them some kind of uh, special treatment. I've been a trade and investment journalist for 10 years. And I will tell you that's not true. And I will give you this scenario. So what are those things we talk about pioneer status for businesses that we give three to five years? tax relief and we say don't pay tax, don't do anything, just make sure your business gets good and gets going and is sustainable and when you are doing well, we start paying tax. Is that not incentive? So how is this different? The people we want you to give this incentive to are not organized companies like the corporates. And so you need to design something that fits their reality. So it's not enough to say other people do business and pay money. We are all subsidized one way or the other. The subsidy they pay on fuel affects every home, including the corporates, including those big men who have 20 cars, and every time they buy a liter of fuel, that liter is subsidized by government. So the more liter of fuel they buy, the more subsidy they actually enjoy, more than the guy who has to trek from Sokoto to Yahuri. How does he even get part of that first subsidy? So it's, well, it's an interesting conversation. It's not enough for us to, <laughs> on the surface, just discard right. certain arguments. They are Nigerians, which is a fact and not contestable. There is even so much we can do with that sector because it's not even currently being taxed. You know, but how do you even get to do all of that? You must first move them from this informal arrangement to some kind of formal sector where they even understand modern way of breeding it gives them even more yield than they are getting right now and when these people prosper the states prosper i think this 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 brings me to this question before we go on a break um ocean state government organized a sensitization program for herdsmen you know 
to sensitize them on the whole anti-open uh, grazing law and all that. Do you think this is a step forward? Would it, would it change anything? Kind of look like a step forward, but it looks like a small step, mm. you know. I think so much more needs to be done. One other brazen gap is that we seem to think that we can just design a structure that should work for these people and all we do is come up and say, okay, this is how we want you to work. This is how you must work. So how much of these people are involved in that whole conversation? Have we even tried understanding these people, you know? Bring them to the table. Let it be that they worked out a system by themselves that will be easy for compliance, taking their peculiar situations into consideration. And then when they are the ones from one of them doing this sensitization, it makes it easy for, for their own stock to take ownership of this project and run with it. You know, so it, it's always that talk about how decisions are made at the top and just shoved down. Uh, people are down thinking that they don't have the capacity to, to think out what a, a solution is. You know, so we, we, we treat them like we are making laws for aliens. Like I said, the Constitution guarantees that wherever you go as a Nigerian, you should be at home and you know you should be able to do whatever you do. Yeah, I, I do not harbor all of the criminalities that happen with destroying farms and you know, with all of that. What I am saying is there are templates of how these issues have been resolved around the world and we need to really be looking at those templates and seeing what we can borrow from there. Let's take a look at the Guardian newspaper here. They, we have some of the stories saying the first one, MFLE, not cause of Naira's woes, says economist. You would also find uh, mob raises Sokoto Commissioner's house, destroyed district head's property. Crisis looms in Kano as Ganduje retains revenue boss, defies legislators. Uh, you'd see also IPOP threatens one-month lockdown of Southeast. We looked at that on the Sun newspaper. Uh, gunmen kill two cops in Inugu Katoe rifles. Uh, the lead story on The Guardian this morning, foreign cargo airlines depart empty over extortion, uh, multiple charges. The writer says two out of 16 sundry charges are illegal, investment reveals. Nigeria's import to export air freight ratio imbalance at, at 87 uh, it is 7.13 and you have also below that over $250 billion agro-allied market potential in waste, stakeholders say. Uh, you also have anti-open grazing law, don't export banditry to south. Uh, Akira Dolu replies, Aerofi. Uh, you would see that uh, on the, uh, the Guardian newspaper. Now, a story of interest for me is the issue of the foreign exchange that has been skyrocketing in the past few days. Uh, economists are making, uh, should I say, excuses for the CBN governor. Uh, what is responsible for this recent happening? I'm not an economist, so maybe I don't qualify to this as what the economists have said, but uh, from reporting the sectors, quite a number of issues, yeah? And these issues are multifaceted. Some responsible domicile with the CBN, quite a large others domicile with other agencies of government, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Trade and Investment, because there is a monetary policy aspect to this, there is a fiscal policy aspect to this, there is a trade policy aspect to this. So the question really is simple economics. The less the supply of, of, of a product, uh, or the more the demand of a product and less supply, prices naturally will go high. Right now, we are at a position where we cannot continue to fret whatever available reserves we have on all kinds of things. At any rate, you mentioned in the review that we have an imbalance in our trade volumes. So we seem to be bringing in more things than we are taking out. Majorly, we basically take out <laughs> crude oil and a few other things, including cocoa. You know, so what that means is, if you are bringing more in, you are spending your dollars to bring them in because you don't spend naira outside the shores of this country, then you are getting from the few things that you are taking out. 
which is largely even uh, petroleum. So the CBN is not responsible, for instance, for how much items we take out to get in more dollars, right? That's a trade policy issue. That's a fiscal policy issue. So the question is, how much of encouragement is going into producing the things that we can export? How much of capacity are we building around adding value to our agro base, which is one of the headlines you mentioned, agro base resources. So what sense does it make in 2021 to take out cocoa and bring back chocolate? What sense does it make to take out crude oil and import Vaseline and import insecticide and import herbicide and import uh, some fertilizers from the same crude oil? So until you add value, you can't earn money from agro-based uh, products, you know. And at any rate, sometimes because of the improper preservation and all, the little we ship are even rejected at the destination point because by the time they get to that place, because they were not properly processed and preserved, they lose, they drop, the quality drops on what they can accept into their system. And so that becomes a loss altogether. That's so, not the CBM. So follow-up to that will be that... Does it now mean that we import more now than we used to import before? As we have always done. Hmm. As we have always done. You know, and these things are encouraged across board. That is why I talked about fiscal policies, trade policies. So how do you evaluate a government that says buys Nigeria first and all our government officials drive Mercedes Bash or GLK? They are not produced in Nigeria. So it's, it's like paying lip service to what you want to do. A, a GLK is anywhere around 28 to 60 million that you have converted into dollar and deposited in the account of a foreign vehicle manufacturing company. How much of value are we adding to even the vehicles we bring in? We have a glass producing company in Nigeria. So how about if you bring in cars, you bring them without the glass, let the glass producing company be the one who feeds that. Now, with every car, Produce. There are over 6,000 items that go into it. Is it the paintings that can be handled by petrochemicals? Is it the electronics? Is it the electricals? Is it the seeds, the fibers? Do you know that most seeds for cars are made from palm fruits from Malaysia? Don't we have palm fruits in Nigeria? Is it the brakes, the hydraulics, the rubber content of it, the bombers? Just name them, 6,000. So you can key into any of these areas if the enabling environment, is it batteries, is it the acids? So if the enabling environments are there, it's not like a car manufacturer manufactures everything. He probably just does the design and the framing and then give every other thing to original equipment manufacturer with specification and they give you exactly what you want. You fit them in and branch the car and it becomes yours. It's, you know, it's just like the services we offer in the banks. Bank A, B, C do not give you anything different. They are just different names and they try to promote themselves on maybe the customer friendliness or the quality of responsiveness that they have. But bottom line, it's about savings, it's about credit. You know, so how much fiscal activities are we seeing to incentivize this thing? Every meek you take in Nigeria that is imported is subsidized by the government of Holland. How much of our local production is subsidized? How can you possibly say produce and, and sell whatever you want to sell 100% and don't pay us any tax? You know, so it is in doing those things that you earn more money and it is those extra reserves that the CBN then sells. So naturally, what you are seeing in the market is scarcity. And if there is supply, scarcity disappears and value drops. Simple as that. Now, if you ask many Nigerians, why don't you patronize made in Nigeria products? A lot of them will say quality. We have bad quality. What can the country do to improve this? I think one notion that we have not properly put out is we, we are quick to celebrate success stories. We don't tell the stories behind the success. So everybody knows how gallant and, and efficient some of these things they patronize about. Where were they some 20, 30, 40 years ago? The story abounds for people who care about history of how India locked itself up, how Cuba locked itself up, how China locked itself up to the world, and endured how whatever terrible things they produced, they kept refining until they became better at it, and they opened up when they could compete. At the time, the shaving stick in India, when you are done with it, you have bombs like this round. They were improving it. The medical people were providing solutions for that, and today... They are the major exporters 
of personnel, you know, from just IT experts alone, India makes well in the excess of $20 billion. Most of the IT firms in the U.S. and the big companies are managed by Indian professionals. The medical industry in the U.K. is, is, is completely uh, serviced by, by the Indians. You know, but they were not always there. Mm. They weren't always there. And what is wrong with some of the quality? Some of the money that these guys need to acquire some of the equipment they need to refine their this thing would not come from the moon. It would come from patronage. So it's lip service that we bog these people down with all kinds of taxes, but on the patronage side of things, they don't get it. I will give you another small indices. The guys who make shoe in a bar, they are only value adding. You know why that is? The skins don't come from Abba. The skins come from Kanu. The skins come from Sokoto. The skins come from Kasena. The paints, the dye, don't come from Abba. They come from the south side. They come from the petrochemicals. The soles don't come from Abba. They come from the southwest, from the rubber plantations. The threads come from the north. Basically, what they do is to assemble each of these things into a shoe that you like. You think if you buy a shoe from Abba, you are buying an Erinchi the Abba guy? No. You have spread that resources across the country because he in turn needs to buy a soil from the southwest, from rubber plantation that has been processed into it. So he needs to buy the petrochemicals from the south side. He needs to get the hides and skin from Kanu. So what you've basically done is that you have retained your spendings in this economy and it has gone around several hands. It has empowered several homes. It has enabled them to keep their children in school. It has enabled them to meet their financial obligation whilst remaining in this country and improving the lot of Nigeria rather than just throw out that money out of this system by a single spending. Mm. That is the dynamics of... So, so you know, it, it's very important that we're having this discussion and critical to the whole conversation about enabling environment. We keep talking about enabling environment. What are the uh, determinants? You know, we understand, yes, government policy, electricity and all of that. Recently, we are talking about VAT. And it appears that that's a major policy that if care is not taken, it could lead to a somersault of some sort, maybe multiple taxation and all of that. How do we draw the lines and balance this? As a person, right, I, I, think, I think the whole tax conversation has been, the whole tax conversation has been degraded. And I say that with all sense of responsibility because how much is this porridge of tax that we seem to want to run mad about anyways? And we have the capacity to do 10 times more. And so it's, we have seen the people who generate most of these taxes that then go into the basket for sharing by everybody saying, we are putting our people and our resources into generating this tax and then it is taken to the table and shared. Then the argument from some other quarters is, we are a federation, the strong should provide for the weak. But if you then begin to properly contextualize or properly analyze what we describe as weak, it's not actually weak. It's us refusing to vitalize areas that have the potentials to bring in more money. Do you know how many horns of the cattle we kill go to waste? Do you know your broken plates comes from horns? Those are worth wasting. Are we adding value? Because it is in value addition and consumption that this tax is coming. Why do you have to move a cow by trailer from Sokoto or Udil to Lagos? Why not site the abattoirs there? Process these cows. Put them in whatever containers you have, freeze, freezer container. Do the labeling, do the ladling do proper transportation, and just deliver them to freezers in Lagos. You have all that other thing you did to the cars are all job creating. All that consumption would then attract you a tax. What are we doing? Why are we fighting over something that is really not significant when we could do more and get more? You know, so, and I think maybe it's an idea whose time has come. It would then begin to challenge people who basically just sit and share from the table to begin to say, where else can we look? And in some cases, the tax are being collected. It's just that there's so much leakages in the system that it is not what is collected that gets to the government. So you now begin, how do you begin to explain why Kaduna makes more tax or get more tax revenues than Kano? 
it beats me, <laughs> you know. Hmm. Uh, and so, that, that is better imagined than so, said. Yeah, so, you know, what's the role of politicians here? Do you think that there's some sort of over-politicization of sensitive and critical issues of, you know, development and all of that? So sometimes I think things have to get really bad to get better. It's my own ideology. Maybe we needed to get to this stage to awaken people who had always felt that there would be free money to share. There are so many docile states in Nigeria. And maybe if what they used to rely on is now threatened, they will begin to learn how to fend for themselves. And indeed, the opportunities to fend for themselves are there. So, but politicians will always be politicians. So sometimes it's, it's a waste of time sometimes discussing why politicians say that. That's the only way they get relevant anyway. But the real conversation is economics. So one of the governors, for instance, was saying, sometimes you deduct this tax at source. If you give a contract, they tell you withholding tax. And the government withhold that tax and remit to FIRS. Is it that these other states are not withholding tax from their contract because we know contracts are ongoing there? So there is a whole lot of conversation that needs to happen. The whole fight is about survival. If you take this from us, what next? And it is because we are not willing to even change that whole narrative. At any rate, the whole question about taxes and VAT only happen, you can only increase those things with an improved economy. You don't tax a debt business. You don't tax a people that are living below poverty. You won't get anything. It is where production is efficient, where consumption is at its peak, that you even get more of this. So we should be worried about the economic uh, uh, state, you know, of the average Nigerian, what is your propensity to spend? If that propensity is higher, then more consultants can be gotten from you. If that propensity is low, even if they fight and they win this war and you are not consuming, the tax are simply not just going to come in. Okay. Now, um, in your reports um, in recent times, have you recorded any objections to the new CBN Forex policy? So it depends on who you are talking to. Every policy has its ups and downs. Nothing. Society is an ongoing conversation. You know, so at every point in time, you tilt either to the right or to the left, depending on several circumstances. So for the people who the policy bites had, naturally they will tell you is the worst thing that has happened as a nation. For those whom it favors, they have all the good things in the world to to say about them. But, but the CBN, in all fairness, has some very critical arguments to back up its actions. If you have given out $5 billion over this channel because you wanted to suppress prices and the prices keep going up, it then means that that money is not getting to the people who should get it. The banking systems themselves are not perfect. And then how do you explain, since they started that approach, how do you explain the Bureau the Change organizations growing from about 1,500 in number to about 8,000? What is so viable in that sector that mm -hmm. we seem to, even far much more than productions, SMEs, and what's happening? Mm -hmm. It then means that individuals are opening multiple channels to be able to bid. It then means just about anybody who can raise that 30 million naira uh, fee, bond fee for the CBN, just simply gets a bit to change allocation. So do we have the monitoring mechanisms as it is as a country to monitor 8,000 bit to change? Come on. How many staff do you even have at the CBN? It's like dedicating one staff to monitoring the activity. And then we are fighting an insurgency. And you are pumping out about $5 billion to an unaccountable sector the question is, how can you tell whether this money are not making their ways into this uh, 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 purification of uh, small arms that we see? How do these people afford these things? You don't buy arms in Naira. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot, lots of questions. And because we do not understand all the metrics that go around that place, because they happen below the surveillance uh, capacity that we have, what is safe is stop that place of this this uh, supply, let's begin to see whether it has any correlation with so the increasing spate of violence that we are seeing in this. I mean, does it not beat your imagination that what is 
we refer to as bandits, now shoot down military airplanes, now have the audacity to approach military installations. You can't shoot down a military airplane with an AK-47. It has to be some kind of rapid mm -hmm. APGs. Mm -hmm. And these things don't come cheap. Not even the pistols that are used for self-protection come cheap. So how do they fund it? Have we been able to tell what happened to all those huge sums that people pay as ransom? My own in-law was killed in Kaduna last January, the doctor's wife. That's my wife's elder brother. And we coughed out a whopping 8 million naira plus a bike and recharge card. Mm -hmm. But eventually when I saw reports of how some of the camps were evaded, the life they live there does not look like people who are touched 8 million naira. So how would you have so much money? That's just from us. How would you have so much money and living in so yeah, much yeah, abject? State, yeah. So it then means that that is just a conduit for something very serious happening. And how do those money then translate into bringing arms and the rest? They have to change from, from Naira to dollar somehow. So these are all complex questions that border on our sovereignty and survival as a country. And if we suspect at the very least that what we are doing in one place has some kind of propensity to increase what's happening on the other, we can save ourselves that headache by just shutting it down. But Whatever we have as an alternative may not be perfect. But that is a genuine concern for, for everybody. But with what we've seen so far, you know, I know it's still very fresh, uh, but are we, does it, is, is there, are there signs that this is yielding any result? Now, so you see, between policy and real effects, there is a time lapse. Usually anywhere around 30 days and 90 days. So you don't make pronouncement and you start seeing the effect immediately. So even if the government tells you you want to spend 50 billion, it doesn't mean the next day you go to the street and find 50 billion, yeah? It takes some contract processing, it takes some approval, it takes some procurement, it takes before actual work at the site begin where the employment happen, where the spending happen. It is at that time that real base effects begin to take place. So this is just a policy. You will begin to see that effect in another 60 to 90 days, you know, but the thing is you have to get done with that pronouncement anyway. You know, so it will be excusable that you are not seeing that ripple effect because the market will react and then it will begin to, it's like a dust and then it settles uh, gradually. Hopefully, this changes our situation. But again, we just got secured a 4 billion euro, euro bond. The euro bond would naturally come in in dollars and the dollars will go to CBN and CBN would then give government the Naira equivalent to carry out those suspending interventions. So extra 4 billion to our coffers is good. We are expecting another extra $4 billion that is applied for it. So if we get $8 billion between now and December, it will boost their capacity to intervene more in the dollar market, and maybe we'll see some stability. But right now, there's so much speculation happening in the market. The BDC guys are also trying to justify that. We have some role to play. So kicking us out would mean you experience this. And those are all the downside effects that you get to this kind of... They are, they are, not, they are not people who we should erroneously regard as nothing. They told you themselves that these singular actions means about 200 billion has gone into waste. So if anybody, if a set of people have 200 billion watches to be confronted with the economy, they are not pushovers. That's not definitely. Now, let's take a look at some more stories on the Punch newspaper. Uh, at the very top, you have uh, Nigeria, 39 others may not attain pre-COVID-19 GDP levels by 2026. That's according to the World Bank. you find that story on page 20. Also, daily fuel consumption jumps to 72 million liters. Subsidy hits 541.66 billion naira. That's... <laughs> Uh, there's a story huge. of interest uh, there. PDP zones national chairs slot to southwest. North gets secretary. secretary. And then you have also Amcon seizes ex-governor Ahmed Houses freezes accounts over 5 billion Naira debt. The lead story on the Punch newspaper. Jega, Utomi groups, others team up against APC, PDP, unveil party October 1. You have uh, PRP, ADC, LP to form nucleus of new mega party. Plan convention. Uh, you also have the writer saying 95 associations seek registration as political parties. More to emerge. 
beside the big picture there, Ohaneze demands Kano's release. IPOP threatens 30-day shutdown. 2023. Southern Presidency Sacrosant. Feniferi backs governors. Ogun prisoners, uh, Ogun pensioners, ground secretariat, lock out SSG protesting 68 billion naira gratuity arrears. So we'll look at that uh, on the show today. Mother Child Initiative support over 3,000 indigent pregnant women. At the very bottom, you have Arufai masquerading as leader exporting banditry to South. That's according to Akira Dolu. Find that on page 7. Pregnant woman, two others kidnapped in Ogun Forest during prayer. Abductors demand 30 million naira. Bello raises campaign team, says rotational presidency, alien to APC. So we always have this concept. Once election is approaching, we always have this concept of mega party. I want you to comment briefly on that before we take a look at the issue of pension i think my guess your guess is as good as it's as good as mine uh, so the question really is what's mega about it and i think we we bring in that that nigerian attitude to to things that should that's supposed to be enduring legacies you know if you really want to do anything anything useful. It's not something you do at the eve of, if you want to form a government that would change the course of this country, it's not something that happened at the eve of elections. That's my thought. This is because we have seen these kind of conversations before. And so you see all kinds of people coming up and in the name of mega party, mega alliances, and at the end of the day, they, they scatter again because there is nothing mega about their philosophy. There is nothing mega about their mentality. It's about individuals looking for bigger refuge. Where else can I go and advance my individual thing? And so when they get into that whole mega arrangement and one person's individual aspiration cannot give way for the other person, they, they again frit uh, out into uh, several smaller units that really cannot make impact. Uh, you know. So that has been the story. Who... How do they secure finances? Who finances this whole concept of megatin? What, what unique ideology are they bringing to the table? They really never talk about what they want to do, how they want to go about it. It's about, oh no, the people in power have not done very well. It's time to throw them away. Yeah, you throw them away and then you bring in people who are worst. That is what our experiences have shown. So the question is, if you want to talk about mega, then you should be able to approach us with some kind of conversations or discussions or consensus that you have built over the years to begin to tell us, we think our educational system as currently run is faulty. This is the model that we want to enshrine if given the opportunity. We think we can do finances better. We think we can do health better. And in very practical times, things that you and I can interrogate and begin to say, okay, this, this makes sense. And you, you, your being mega is not just about winning power. It's also about coming up with alternative policies to the ruling administration. So, oh, no, this forest policy doesn't look like the best. We have put up a think tank and they, are, they seem to be suggesting this template or we think there should be a tweak there. You don't have to get into power to begin to act mega. You know, you can start doing mega oppositions mega alternative suggestions mm -hmm. and then you transform into when people have continued to say oh no this guy seems to be saying something good at some point they said uh, okay since we have tried this guy and he don't seem to be getting these guys with the alternative idea can we give them a look in you know so that's that's my idea of what's mega it's not about sitting somewhere very high on ideas and when you get to the driver's seat and you're confronted with realities you just you just crash the the the, so, the, so, the, so, the so plane. Would you say there needs to be some form of regulation to creating such sub parties. So we live in a free state that guarantees freedom of association. As many as they want to create, they can. What I am saying is that we have to go beyond leap service. I think the the word mega in Nigeria has become a cliche. Uh, you know, let us see the mega in your actions, in your modus operandi. In, this, in some sort of documents and action that suggest that this looks like a change, you know, rather than the usual things that we have seen every time on the eve of election, all kinds of people coming together and, and then 
once the their interest is not fulfilled. Some people come in hoping that they will get the ticket for that mega arrangement. And once that doesn't happen, they break into. They are coming into this, and we know from various experience in reporting that they already have created another special purpose vehicle with another person's name waiting and saying, "Oh, if these guys don't give me this party ticket, I will just simply move into my private arrangements and move on." So. If you have those kind of plan, then it means you also don't trust the whole concept of the mega arrangements that you are going into. That's my, my view of it.